President DeJoya, Dean Halpern, Director Sharma, Ambassador, Congresswoman, dear professors, alumni, and also present students of Georgetown, MSFS, or SFS. So happy to have you here tonight as well. Good evening to all of you. Uh, and well, above all, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here, for inviting me to participate in this wonderful MSFS Centennial Gala. It's certainly a true honor to take the floor. Um, it's quite a challenge, I see, having all of you in front of me. Uh, and it's a pleasure to actually visit for the first time this magnificent building of the United States uh, uh, History for Peace. Uh, and I share with all of you this unique occasion, uh, unique for Georgetown, unique for the School of Foreign Service, and unique for all of us. I have to admit, this event is also very special to me. Uh, together with some distinguished classmates. Yes. I finished my master's degree in 27 years ago. I only have an excellent, wonderful memories of the time I spent here. All those memories bring to my mind precisely at a time like this. But I will spare the details. It could easily drift out of focus. But I have to say, I'm thrilled to see so many good friends, good Georgetown friends, all professors, deans, Dean Crow, Dean Goodman, professors, to see you, Jeff Corbin. And I'm probably missing out on some of you. It's really a great occasion to see all of you. Um, the list would be long, so bear with me. I would like to congratulate, on the other hand, those who have received this special MSFS Centennial Living Our Values Award. All certainly well deserved. Too many differences, but please allow me and pardon me for signaling out and being a little partial among, uh, by mentioning one amongst them. And that is, of course, my dear Icelandic friend, Raga Anandatu. Since I can personally testify to her merits to how much and well she has lived up to those Georgetown values, the MSFS and the SFS values that we now celebrate. She certainly is one of Georgetown's finest and fabulous friends. Is it a little As I was flying over yesterday uh, and thinking about the last time I was in town, the last time I was on campus, uh, that was three years ago, at another centennial. And it dawned to me that, yes, it was soon before uh, we all entered into that horrific time of COVID when we celebrated that centennial of the Mother's School and the Walsh School of Foreign Service. Little did we know what we were heading into a couple of months later. So I'm extra happy to see you all after all that ordeal, the anguish, the suffering, the disbelief. We all lost friends, loved ones, or people we worked with or just knew. We will always remember and honor those we lost. But here we are again, celebrating a legacy and ready to look ahead with hope and gratitude. Celebrating a centenary is indeed a great opportunity, not just to look at the past, but also, of course, to explore what is to come. In fact, I would argue that the true purpose of anniversaries 
is precisely that, enable us to project uh, ourselves into the future. I suggest, therefore, that we take some time, just a few minutes, don't worry, <laughs> to think about the world we're going to inhabit and to reflect on what that world will demand on our policymakers, our diplomats, our civil servants, business leaders, and the society at large. Most importantly, owing to this Georgetown occasion, one of the world's, if not the most prominent, prominent institutions of learning, we should also explore what does all this mean to the role of universities. Let me be quite direct in my opening statement on the matter. The world of 2022 looks every bit as challenging as that of 1992, 22. I dare say perhaps even more so. We are entering a period of major changes to the national and international order, changes of a scale we have now witnessed for the past three decades when, remember, the Iron Curtain came tumbling down. I will try to capture these changes, changes and their implications through the lens of three major features defining global affairs. The first is a marked increase of the velocity change. We live in exponentially changing societies. Sometimes we fail to fully grasp just how fast the world is changing around us. Just one example. We as a society created more data in the past 24 months than in the past 20,000 years. Granted, most of this data were photos of people's cats. <laughs> of kids sharing the latest stuff with us, maybe some adults as well. But a lot of it was certainly relevant information. The major driver of this exponential change is technological innovation and disruption. In almost every field we witness revolutionary innovations, whether it is in health or in the biosciences, robotics, cyber, AI, to mention just a these innovations bring with them immense benefits, like increasing of life expectancy, or enabling greater access to education, or discovering how to cure severe illnesses. They also bring, however, major challenges, from the tightening of the public space for debate, to shifts in the jobs market that in turn are leading to imbalances in income generation and distribution, from the emergence to, of uh, new security threats to the pervasive exposure to toxic or false information. What does all of this mean for the future of higher education? Well, around you it's difficult to be too uh, precise and too exhaustive, but, uh, and I'm not sure everyone, anyone has the full answer. But let me put forward just a few. First, strategic foresight should become a central skill set for students going through our universities. A fast moving world requires individuals who can envision and navigate the future. Second, we should train our leaders to be adaptive and to be open to reskilling, retooling, reconnecting with our fundamental values and sense of purpose in a highly connected and accelerated society. So lifelong learning will be key. And third, no one should be graduating from college without digital skills. Not understanding how basic technologies work will be a major impediment to effective leadership. The flip side of this coin is grasping the implications of technologies for society. In the domain of global affairs, this means by particularly training people who can lead an effective technological diplomacy. The second feature of global affairs to, uh, today is forced inter interdependence. We are all interconnected and in, in unprecedented ways. The innovation that takes place in Silicon Valley can disrupt entire industries on the other side of the planet. 
And yet this interdependence is coming apart as we speak. If the war of the, in Ukraine teaches us anything, is that our relations can be easily fractured. The sanctions imposed on Russia in response to its illegal and unjustified invasion of Ukraine have meant undoing over 30 years of slow economic integration. By the time this war is over, the diplomatic, economic, and cultural exchanges between Russia and the rest of the world, in particular between Russia and the EU and the EU, US, will be a fraction of what they were before. So our graduates will need to be well equipped and able to navigate both realities. On the one hand, a tight integrated world, which will require a global mindset and the capacity to engage with different particular cultures and traditions, and yet also be prepared to navigate the uncertainty of a changing international order. For this latter challenge, I believe the best advice is to develop, um, guess what, interdisciplinary approach to learning. In fact, it will be growingly hard to understand the world around us without some combination of knowledge from the fields of economics, political science, sociology, and international affairs. This approach, however, is no surprise for us, since it is actually something I remember quite vividly from the, my time at Georgetown. And the third final feature of global politics today is fragility. Not just fragility of the global order itself, but also of many of its parts. And here I would like to make a particular reference to the equity and justice of our societies and the urgent need to build an economic model that aims to include and lift everyone. The degree of polarization we see in the Western world is hard to explain without understanding the social tensions that exist in many countries. The domestic fragility has international implications. It becomes much more difficult to uphold the international political order if there is political discord within the world's liberal democracies. The implications of this for the way we design an effective education are manifold. The first is that the frontier between domestic and global issues is growing ever thinner, and hence graduates of universities should be able to connect the two. And second, we, should, we would do well to instill in students a desire to understand the troubles of others and to be empathetic. This will make them better leaders, but also better intellectuals, because they will also see the world through the eyes of others. And that might just help them learn, grow, converge, or negotiate, steering away from the zero-sum game. I am certain the world, human civilization, would gain immensely. It may sound utopic or idealistic, but I think it's well worth a try. And my time in Georgetown taught me that. Finally, I wish to end my brief speech here. We should make uh, sure that graduates leave the university with a strong sense of public service. And I don't mean necessarily or exclusively with a desire to work for government. Public service is about caring for the greater good, desiring to address common challenges and forwarding a shared vision of the world. We need great doses of all of these in the world today. The program we're celebrating is a master in foreign service. So much of the life we lived is about service working with and for others, and about making life slightly better for those around us. To achieve this, we cannot forget the permanent values that must inspire effective leadership. 
commitment, responsibility, ethics and solidarity, effort and honesty. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to share these reflections on the state of the world and the role of universities in addressing the many challenges we face. We have all the tools to navigate what lies before us. And we also have excellent institutions of learning all over the world, particularly here in Georgetown University, which will support us along the way and will surely train the next generation of global leaders. Here is to another hundred years of excellence in education. And as I said, to a Georgetown commencement, commencement speech in 2005, it was 10 years after Good luck to you all, work hard, enjoy life, and congratulations to you and your proud parents. Just one last thing, remember how much Georgetown has given us.